But uh, my opponent feels like she does not have to be here, which is deeply disrespectful to the event, and in particular to our great Catholic community. Very disrespectful. <laughs> the last Democrat not to attend this important event was Walter Mondale. Very grateful to be endorsed by one of the nation's largest Catholic advocacy groups, Catholic Vote. It's called Catholic Vote. And I just want to thank them. They are incredible. Now, I don't know what it is with Catholics, but the FBI is going after Catholics. What is going — who would — why would any Catholic vote for a Democrat? You too. Like the Catholics for Harris Walls national organizing call and events held by Catholics for Trump. Former President Trump's rallies have drawn the attention of Catholics well, from playing the Ave Maria. Put on Pavarotti singing Ave Maria. Nice and loud. Turn it up louder. We want a little action here. To receiving a relic of the true cross and a brown scapular from a Carmelite friar. And the former president's own social media posts wishing the Virgin Mary a happy birthday and invoking St. Michael the Archangel's intercession reportedly aimed at Catholic voters online. The issue of abortion arose as a challenge to the Trump campaign after it moved away from the once strong protections for life. Supporting controversial in vitro fertilization procedures, Catholic teaching came to the forefront, this time before the renowned Al Smith dinner in New York. Will you have a religious exemption to your IVF mandate for religious organizations and businesses that feel this violates my religious principles. Well, you know, I haven't been asked that, but it sounds to me like a pretty good idea. That same evening was also controversial for the Harris campaign. Vice President Kamala Harris drew sharp criticism for declining to attend, choosing to submit a video message instead. It's time for a woman, bro! Early in the election season, another presidential candidate tried to meld faith and politics. Peter Sonsky for the American Solidarity Party. Described as a faithful Catholic and father of nine, he shared his goals with reporter Mark Irons. The fundamental basis of our party's stance is the dignity of human life. Um, everything is about human beings. Whatever policy it is, is it health care, is it the environment, is it international uh, relations, is it interstate commerce? Mark, Every one of these things boils down to the good of the human person. The United States Conference of Catholic Bishops in their document, The Role of the Church in American Political Life, reminded the faithful, it's our responsibility to learn more of Catholic teaching and tradition, to participate in church life, to learn from trustworthy sources about the issues facing our communities, and to do our best to make wise judgments. It's a surprise to everybody to suddenly discover that there's a Catholic in the White House. She doesn't have a Catholic wedding, but she does have the rosary at her wedding, an uh, outward sign of an interior commitment. Chad Pecknold is the Catholic University at the of the Catholic University says there is a touch of hidden providence in the First Lady keeping her faith unbeknownst to the public, and that it is a further indication that a commitment to religious liberty is a priority for the president. The First Lady's office declined to offer us a direct confirmation of this news, a sign perhaps of Melania Trump's continued wish for privacy. Joining us now, and I'm proud to be partnering with my very good friend Lee Greenwood. Who doesn't love his song, God Bless the USA, in connection with promoting the God Bless the USA Bible? This Bible is the King James Version and also includes our founding father documents. Yes, the Constitution, which I'm fighting for every single day very hard to keep Americans protected. Also, the Bill of Rights, the Declaration of Independence, and the Pledge of Allegiance are all part of this. God bless the USA Bible, and it's just very important and very important to me. I want to have a lot of people have it. You have to have it for your heart, for your soul. Many of you have never read them and don't know the liberties and rights you have as Americans and how you are being threatened to lose those rights. It's happening all the time. It's a very sad thing that's going on in our country, but we're going to get it turned around. Religion and Christianity are the biggest things missing from this country. And I truly believe that we need to bring them back, and we have to bring them back fast. I think it's one of the biggest problems we have. That's why our country is going haywire. We've lost religion in our country. All Americans need a Bible in their home, and I have many. It's my favorite book. It's a lot of people's favorite book. 
This Bible is a reminder that the biggest thing we have to bring back America and to make America great again is our religion. Religion is so important. It's so missing, but it's going to come back, and it's going to come back strong, just like our country is going to come back strong. In the end, we do not answer to bureaucrats in Washington. We answer to God in heaven. Christians are under siege. We must protect content that is pro-God. We love God, and we have to protect anything that is pro-God. We must defend God in the public square and not allow the media or the left-wing groups to silence, censor, or discriminate against us. We have to bring Christianity back into our lives and back into what will be, again, a great nation. Our founding fathers did a tremendous thing when they built America on Judeo-Christian values. Now that foundation is under attack, perhaps as never before. What can we do? Stand up, speak out, and pray that God will bless America again. I'm proud to endorse and encourage you to get this Bible. We must make America pray again. Pray, get educated, get motivated, and stand with me and the legions of Americans asking God to bless. Again, Christians, get out and vote just this time. You won't have to do it anymore. Four more years, you know what? It'll be fixed, it'll be fine. You won't have to vote anymore, my beautiful Christians. I love you, Christians. I'm a Christian. I love you. Get out. You got to get out and vote. In four years, you don't have to vote again. We'll have it fixed so good, you're not going to have to vote. When the Supreme Court was established in 1789, the first members came from among the ranks of the Founding Fathers and were almost uniformly Protestant. Of the 116 justices who have been appointed to the court, 92 have been from various Protestant denominations and 15 have been Catholics. Today, the majority of the court consists of Catholic justices, to varying degrees. Let's take a look at the faith journey of each Catholic justice as well as the confusion that surrounds the faith of Justices Neil Gorsuch and Sonia Sotomayor. Clarence Thomas was born in Pinpoint, Georgia. After his father abandoned the family, he was raised by his grandfather in a poor area near Savannah. Thomas, then a second grader, was sent with his brother to St. Benedict the Moore Grammar School in Savannah, Georgia. He was not Catholic at the time but would convert at a young age. Thomas became a Catholic seminarian and studied for a year at Conception Abbey Seminary in Missouri. Thomas, who grew up in the segregated South, was only the second black justice to serve on the Supreme Court. He stated, Because I am a child of God, there is no force on this earth that can make me any less than a man of equal dignity and equal worth. From there, Thomas attended the College of the Holy Cross and Yale Law School. He worked his way up through the court system and was nominated to the Supreme Court in 1991 by George H. W. Bush. When it comes to Justice Neil Gorsuch, he is often counted as one of the Catholics of the court. However, his situation seems to be more complex than that. As a child, Gorsuch attended Christ the King Roman Catholic School, a private grade school in Denver. His family regularly attended Mass. Later, Gorsuch's family moved to Bethesda, Maryland. He enrolled in Georgetown Preparatory School, a selective Jesuit college prep school. In 1996, Gorsuch married his wife, Marie, who was a member of the Church of England growing up. They married in an Anglican church. After the wedding, the couple joined Holy Comforter, an Episcopal parish in Vienna, Virginia, attending weekly services. Gorsuch volunteered there as an usher, the family later attended St. John's Episcopal Church in Boulder, Colorado, a liberal church with a long-standing open-door policy for the LGBT community. 
he has not publicly clarified his religious affiliations. Amy Coney Barrett is the fifth woman to serve on the Supreme Court and is the mother to seven children. As a child, her family was devoutly Catholic, and her father is an ordained deacon at St. Catherine of Siena Parish in Louisiana, where she grew up. Barrett attended St. Mary's Dominican High School, an all-girls Roman Catholic high school in New Orleans. She was student body vice president of the school and graduated in 1990. Barrett is a member of the Christian parachurch community People of Praise, an ecumenical covenant community founded in South Bend. It's associated with the Catholic Charismatic Renewal Movement, but not formally affiliated with the Catholic Church. In a 2006 speech, Barrett stated that a legal career is but a means to an end, and that end is building the kingdom of God. Brett Kavanaugh was born in Washington, D.C., and was raised in Bethesda, Maryland. As a teenager, he attended Georgetown Preparatory School, a Jesuit boys' college prep school, where he was two years ahead of Neil Gorsuch. Kavanaugh is a Roman Catholic and serves as a regular lector at the Shrine of the Most Blessed Sacrament in Washington, D.C. He has helped serve meals to the homeless as part of church programs and has tutored at the Washington Jesuit Academy, a Catholic private school in the District of Columbia. Kavanaugh has been less vocal about his faith than other justices, but during his confirmation hearings, he said, The motto of my Jesuit high school was, Men for others. I have tried to live that creed. The motto, Men for others, was popularized in a 1973 speech to alumni of Jesuit schools by Pedro Arupe, who was then the superior general of the Jesuits. Sonia Sotomayor was raised Catholic, but many are uncertain as to where her faith lies today. Her stances on issues such as abortion and same-sex marriage put her strongly at odds with the teachings of the Catholic Church. However, her support for abortion services puts her in sync with the majority of Catholics in America. Pew Research data indicates that upwards of 56% of self-identifying Catholics support abortion in all or most cases. Jesuit father Joseph O'Hare, who previously worked with Sotomayor, said when he knew her beginning in the late 1980s, she was indeed a practicing Catholic. He said he has no reason to think that has changed. Sotomayor has publicly addressed her faith when she said, I think being a Catholic made me a better person. It taught me how to choose good over evil and how to be a more caring human being. It seems safe to say that, like many other prominent figures in American politics, Sotomayor is a cafeteria Catholic who picks and chooses the aspects of the faith she wishes to follow. Samuel Alito, a faithful Catholic and the author of the court decision that overturned Roe v. Wade, has been very vocal about his faith over the years. In 2022, in a lecture to law students at the Catholic University of America, Alito stated, a person's faith shapes what kind of person he is. It also should affect the way you treat people when you're serving as a judge. Alito was recently secretly recorded by a progressive activist when he said, People in this country who believe in God have got to keep fighting for that, to return our country to a place of godliness. Alito took a lot of heat in the media over this, but the comments are perfectly in sync with the Catholic faith we know Alito to possess. The goal of a Supreme Court justice is to be impartial, not neutral. Chief Justice John Roberts was born in Buffalo, New York, but mostly grew up in Long Beach, Indiana. He was born to Jack and Rosemary Roberts, both devout Catholics. Roberts attended the La Lumiere School, an academically rigorous Catholic boarding school in La Porte, Indiana, where he captained the school's football team, participated in track and field, and was a regional champion in wrestling. Roberts gained a reputation as a serious student when he attended Harvard. Every Sunday, he attended Catholic Mass at St. Paul Church. Chief Justice Roberts keeps his personal views on his faith close to his chest, and there is very little information out there where he talks about his Catholicism. What we do know is that Roberts has been a strong defender of religious liberty and a leader on the issue within the court. During the nearly two-decade tenure of Chief Justice John Roberts, 
The nation's high court has in many ways redefined the meaning of religious freedom in America. The Supreme Court has become not only a robust defender of those with sincerely held religious beliefs, it has also become a court not shy about overturning previous decisions about the meaning of the First Amendment. And I just have to remind people that when Donald Trump was president, the southern border was secure and America was safe. And thank God for that. So I know all of you are praying for me, and I know we got a lot of Catholics for Trump. I see the signs here. Thank you, Catholics for Trump. And we got a lot of non-Catholics as well. And I just wanted to say, I know, I know you're praying for me. I know, and, I, and I really do appreciate it. I need, I need those prayers every single day. But maybe why did I become a Catholic? I mean, there are all these things that I could point to. But you know, one. I really liked that the Catholic Church was just really old. J.D. Vance, he used to be a Christian, whatever that means, and then he became evangelical-ish, but now he's a professing Roman Catholic, baptized into the Roman Catholic Church, which, by the way, that's how you get into the kingdom. Your entrance is through the ceremony of baptism. But the question is, why? Why did a man move from grace alone to grace plus works? And we should answer that question because this is a trend in evangelical Christianity. Young people that grow up in evangelical homes are moving to Rome. Why? J.D. Vance, extremely typical. He wants something that's ancient. He wants something that's connected to the past. I, I want the direct line back to the first century church. So they think the Roman Catholic Church has that connection, so they scoot to Rome. And this is a trend that's happening a lot. So if you do not want your child to think, I have to go to the Vatican to be connected to my past, you need to take them on a tour of their Protestant history. And question that many of us have asked is, when did this happen? When exactly did the Catholic Church start getting all wonky? After all, that's why we had that little old Protestant Reformation Let's jump into our DeLorean and take a look back in time. Uh, the very early years of the church, not the Roman Catholic Church. It didn't become that till the Bishop of Rome amassed a whole lot of power. But in the first few centuries, basically, we were banging out orthodoxy. And please note, not every church father that you read is worthy of your respect because not all were actually orthodox. But... It wasn't until, give or take, 4th century that the church started teetering over the edge of orthodoxy. And the Roman Catholic Church has been zooming down that slippery slope of heresy ever since. Number one, prayers for the dead. They can't actually hear a word from us. Started, give or take, 300 A.D. Veneration of dead saints, the 370s. Mass, daily re-sacrificing of Jesus Christ on the cross. That was about late 300s. Marian dogmas, early, mid-400s, referring to Mary as Theotokos, which is right because she is the mother of God, but many intended that to elevate her to divine-like status. That's a big no-no, and so is the doctrine of purgatory, which totally undermines the redemptive work of Jesus, where you go to some netherland to pay for your own sins. About the late 500s. Prayers to Mary, give or take 600. Worship of images and relics, late 700s. Do you see the progression? Canonization of saints, late 900s, the celibacy of priests. Wow, I guess a lot of priests were sinning for centuries. It's found nowhere in Scripture, which has led to an avalanche of sexual perversion among priests throughout history. That was the early thousands. Indulgences, Luther's pet peeve, late 1100s. The transubstantiation of the elements of bread and wine. 
where a priest calls down Jesus from heaven, somehow mystically, bibbity bobbity boo like the bread and the wine actually become the physical body and blood of Jesus Christ, re-sacrificing him on the altar. That was 1215, and we now see a little bit of a respite of bad teachings being enshrined in the Roman Catholic Church until the 16th century. It was the Roman Catholic Council of Trent. It ran for a number of years, starting in 1545. They were the counter-reformation. They had to do something about all of these reformers who have exposed the Catholic Church. So what did they conclude at the Council of Trent, well, they needed some more books. <laughs> they had to find their false teachings someplace. So they said, hey, let's incorporate the Apocrypha. Protestants did not take books out of the Bible. The Roman Catholic Church injected new books into the Bible. Later, in 1854, the Immaculate Conception of Mary, that was made doctrine, meaning... Mary was not imbued with original sin like, you know, every other human being ever, but she was immaculately conceived and born free of sin. The thinking behind it is that, well, since Mary birthed Jesus, she had to be free of sin. But if Mary had to be free of sin, doesn't that mean that Mary's mother had to be free of sin? And if Mary's mother had to be born free of sin, doesn't that mean that her grandmother had to be born free of sin? And that is what we call an infinite regress. 1950, hmm, perhaps the culmination of all false teachings, the assumption of Mary into heaven. You know, the same way that Jesus ascended into heaven, despite the fact that he claimed that he was the only one to do that, the Catholic Church said, Mary to 1962. Don't care to stay there, but let's go there for a moment. This is when the Roman Catholic Church decided we got to drag ourselves into modernity. So what did they do? They called the Second Vatican Council, Vatican II, or if you speak Latin, that would be Vatican II. They ditched Latin from the liturgy. They started reading the Bible in English. On the one hand, that's not so good because now people could actually understand a lot of damning theology. On the other hand, now Roman Catholics could hear and learn in the Bible, in their own language, what we Protestants have known all along. We are saved by grace alone, faith alone, Christ alone, to the glory of God alone, revealed in Scripture alone. 1992, publication of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Have one of those when you're talking to a Roman Catholic who will say, no, we don't believe in work salvation. You can bring them to the Roman Catholic Catechism. 1992, they said there's no salvation outside of the Catholic Church and their official doctrine. Finally, one major note of heresy. Granted, this is not yet official Roman Catholic doctrine or dogma, but it's been gaining some serious ground, and it is seriously blasphemous. Mary is the co-redemptrix, so much for the glory of God alone, the co-mediatrix alongside of Jesus. Hold the phone, Henrietta. First Timothy 2 tells us there is one mediator between God and man, and it ain't Mary, and it ain't the Pope. There is only one Savior, and his name is Jesus Christ. So now you might be scratching your head and wondering, hey, if the Roman Catholic Church got that wonky, were there any Christians? Remember, the Roman Catholic Church didn't become the Roman Catholic Church 400s at best, 500s perhaps. So you always had believers prior to the Catholic Church going off the rails, and you always had believers inside of the church. We see reformers throughout the Middle Ages who believed in grace alone, faith alone, in Christ alone. We know that God was still building his church despite the building of the Roman Catholic Church. Not everyone was infected with unbiblical dogma. Not every Catholic believed every tenant every false teaching of the church. Jesus has always had his sheep, even before Martin Luther nailed those complaints against a Catholic door in Wittenberg in 1517. Here I stand, 
I can do no other. God help me. And finally, and this time I finally, finally mean it, if you are a Roman Catholic who has been enduring this video, you might be a little hot under the collar. Please don't think that we hate you. It's a million miles from that. We do love you, and we would love to see the very heavy work-righteous yoke that the Catholic Church has laid on your shoulders replaced with the easy burden and light yoke of Christ Jesus. Please find yourself a church that teaches sola and tota, only and completely Scripture, and sit under a man who sits under Jesus. You consider the Roman Catholic Church an apostate church, is that Catholic priests are false mediators. Explain how they're false mediators. Well, the Bible says there is only one mediator between God and man, that's the man Christ Jesus, 1 Timothy 2, verse 5. And so Roman Catholics are told they must go through the priest in order to confess their sins. And so he is a mediator between God and man. The Roman Catholic Church also has another sinless mediator. Her name is Mary, and many Roman Catholic women prefer to go through Mary rather than through Christ in order to obtain favor from God. And so the Roman Catholic priest and even Roman Catholic saints are said to be places that Catholics can pray to as other mediators between them and God. Mike. Paragraph 1367 of the Roman Catholic Catechism says this, the sacrifice of Christ and the sacrifice of the Eucharist are one single sacrifice. The victim is one and the same. In this divine sacrifice, the same Christ who offered himself once in a bloody manner on the altar of the cross is contained and is offered in an unbloody manner. You say that because of a statement like that, the Roman Catholic Church is engaging in idolatry how is that idolatry? Well, by the authority of Scripture, we can say that that's not the true Christ. It's an imposter. It's a counterfeit Christ. Because in Hebrews 9.28, it says Jesus will return a second time. The Catholic Church teaches that the priest has the power to call Almighty God, the Lord Jesus Christ, down from heaven to continue on an altar what he finished on the cross. And so when the priest lifts up the Eucharist for Catholics to worship it, that's idolatry because it's a false Christ. And after the Catholics worship this Eucharist as their savior, the priest lays it on the altar to be offered up as a victim. Christ was never a victim. He went to the cross willingly. And so the Catholic Church denies the finished work of Christ, calling him back down from heaven every day to continue what he finished on the cross. Mike, you say that the Roman Catholic Church usurps the sovereignty of God. You write, the Roman Catholic priests are said to do what only the Sovereign Lord can do, and that is raise spiritually dead people to life. Rome teaches, through baptism, we are freed from sin and reborn as sons of God. Baptism is the sacrament of regeneration through water in the Word, and that's paragraph 1213 of the Roman Catholic Catechism. Why do you take such an issue with the way the Roman Catholic Church views salvation in that regard? Basically because of what we read in John chapter 3, that regeneration is a sovereign work of the Holy Spirit. And that's where you have Nicodemus and the Lord Jesus dealing with this whole subject of regeneration. And Jesus says it's like the wind. You don't know where it's coming from or where it's going but you must be born again, you must be regenerated. If you back up in, into John chapter one, you see that it's the work of God, not of man. But the Roman Catholic priests say they have the power to regenerate a dead soul, which is normally an infant, seven day old infant, by sprinkling efficacious waters over the baby. And so that is said to be the sacrament of regeneration, where the infant is now born again, a child of God, but later on, that child can commit a mortal sin and end up in hell. And so when the Roman Catholic Church regenerates an infant through the sacrament, they must maintain a sinless life that is without mortal sin in order to remain born again. It's usurping the sovereign work of the Holy Spirit because only God can bring forth those who are dead in their sin. We see in even in Titus chapter 3, verse 5, that that we are 
it's because of God's mercy, not because of righteous things we have done. And it's the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit who washes us clean. And so the Roman Catholic Church, again, opposes the Word of God, opposes the sovereignty of God by daring to say that the priests have that power to bring those who are dead in sin to a life in Christ. Ezekiel 8. And it came to pass in the sixth year, in the sixth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I sat in mine house, and the elders of Judah sat before me, that the hand of the Lord God fell there upon me. Then I beheld, and lo, a likeness as the appearance of fire, from the appearance of his loins even downward of fire, and from his loins even upward, as the appearance of brightness as the color of amber. And he put forth the form of an hand, and took me by a lock of mine head, and the Spirit lifted me up between the earth and the heaven, and brought me in the visions of God to Jerusalem, to the door of the inner gate that looketh toward the north, where was the seat of the image of jealousy, which provoketh to jealousy. And behold, the glory of the God of Israel was there, according to the vision that I saw in the plain. Then said he unto me, Son of man, Lift up thine eyes now the way toward the north. So I lifted up mine eyes the way toward the north, and behold, northward at the gate of the altar this image of jealousy in the entry. He said furthermore unto me, Son of man, seest thou what they do? Even the great abominations that the house of Israel committeth here, that I should go far off from my sanctuary? But turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations." And he brought me to the door of the court, and when I looked, behold, a hole in the wall. Then said he unto me, Son of man, dig now in the wall. And when I had digged in the wall, behold, a door. And he said unto me, Go in, and behold the wicked abominations that they do here. So I went in and saw, and behold, every form of creeping things, and abominable beasts, and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the wall round about. And there stood before them seventy men of the ancients of the house of Israel, and in the midst of them stood Jaazaniah the son of Shaphan, with every man his censer in his hand, and a thick cloud of incense went up. Then said he unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark, every man in the chambers of his imagery? For they say, The Lord seeth us not, the Lord hath forsaken the earth. He said also unto me, Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations that they do. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north, and behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. Then said he unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations than these. And he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house, and behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about five and twenty men, with their backs toward the temple of the Lord, and their faces toward the east. And they worshipped the sun toward the east. Then he said unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Is it a light thing to the house of Judah that they commit the abominations which they commit here? For they have filled the land with violence, and have returned to provoke me to anger, and lo, they put the branch to their nose. Therefore will I also deal in fury. Mine eye shall not spare, neither will I have pity, and though they cry in mine ears with a loud voice, yet will I not. Illustrated, true, but some of the photographs used were more than mere illustrations. They were absolute 
dynamite. These photographs powerfully exposed the pagan underbelly of the Roman Catholic Church, and that was its strength. Let me give you an example. We once got a letter from a man. I, I, I don't want to say he was Presbyterian because I don't have the letter and I don't remember his faith. All right, but we once got this letter from this person who said he was in church about to take communion when the plate with the round wafers was put in front of him. He had read our book, studied the photographs and recognized the pagan identity of the round wafer. Now the amazing thing is I don't recall any specific photograph of that round wafer or Eucharist being in our book. But there evidently was enough about the pagan invasion of Christianity in there that he said he felt like tossing the entire dish of wafers out the church window. Good for him. Why do I say that? Because before Christ returns, true, genuine Christianity must be brought out from under the rubbish Satan has heaped on it. For millennia, mankind has studied the path of the planets. Nothing wrong with that. But when you move from astronomy to astrology and come up with the zodiac and the solar wheel and horoscope and purport to be able to divine human behavior from the alignment of the planets when an individual was born, the Bible condemns that. You have become what the Bible calls an observer of the times when you do that. And you have moved into the occult. Here is God speaking through Moses in Deuteronomy 18, 9 to 12. Or speaking to Moses. When you are come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone that makes his son or his daughter to pass through the fire. That's a pagan practice. Or that uses divination or an observer of times or an enchanter or a witch or a charmer or a consulter with familiar spirits or a wizard or a necromancer. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. Deuteronomy 18, 9 to 12. In addition to the heavens themselves, mankind seems always to have been fascinated with the sun. Stonehenge and the pyramids tell us that. But to carry it over into the worship of God, as I said, no way. The two cannot be mixed. And wherever they are, the occult has got to go. It has got to be repudiated, banished into the wilderness, put away from us. So let's look at a few examples of pagan or occult practices pointed out in this book, the new illustrated great controversy, which, as I said, we're making better. We'll start with number one, the solar wheel. The solar wheel adorns quite a bit of Catholic architecture. Here's a picture of one we took while we were in Portugal at a little place called Evora. A few months ago, we used a drone. So you see members of the team there and we're practicing and we're going up to that, to that solar wheel. I saw it and I knew that there would be value in it and sent that drone up there to take a shot. These solar wheels are not only to be found on Catholic churches. The Vatican itself is laid out like a giant solar wheel. There's that picture from our book on your screen. What is this doing at the headquarters of an institution that purports to be Christian. As I said, it is from the solar wheel that we get the horoscope which God condemns. Number two, the mitre. The next piece of rubbish I'd like to draw your attention to today is not the round way for that that man felt like tossing out the window, but the mitre of the priests who administer the wafer. That'll put the wafer itself in context. Where do we see this mitre first? Look at this picture. On Dagon, the father of Baal, the sun god. When I say father, in classical literature or pagan literature, Dagon was thought to be the daddy of Baal, who was the sun god of Phoenicia. While the full-blown fish mitre adorns Dagon's priests, a truncated version featuring only the open mouth of the fish adorns the pope. 
This mitre is so important to the Vatican that they even bury their popes in them. I want you to take a time and just look at the shots that I'm putting up on your screen. Isn't this telling us something about the true loyalty of the popes? Why bury them in any version of Dagon's mitre? Tragically, even once Protestant Anglican priests now wear this vestige of Baal worship. But there's more. The third item, the monstrance. Once again, before we look at the round wafer or Eucharist, let's look at the container in which the wafer is placed for adoration. It's called a monstrance. Let's look at a few. What is common to all of them? The sunburst. Now, I don't know the significance of this motif, which predates Christianity. Some say it's a cosmic symbol of the sun mating with the moon. I don't know what that's supposed to mean. But look here. Look at this monstrance on your screen. Can't you see the crescent moon itself used as a frame or holder for the round wafer? Friend, what is this doing in Christianity? With that under our belts, now I think we can turn to the wafer itself, the Eucharist. Admittedly, this picture isn't in our book, but let's ask the question anyhow. Why is the Eucharist round? The bread is supposed to represent the broken body of Jesus. So what part of Jesus is round? Friend, can't you see it? The Eucharist is round because like the mitre itself a throwback to the sun god Baal, and like the monstrance, which is borrowed from paganism, this round wafer clearly represents the round S-U-N, not the S-O-N. Beloved, the mitre, the monstrance, and the Eucharist are pure paganism, and not just paganism, but sun worship. And they've crept into the church. Do you know how many millions of so-called heretics were slaughtered? Because they refused to bow down before this piece of bread. Which the Catholic Church teaches is the actual body of God. Listen. Are you beginning to see some dots here that may be disturbing you? Some dots you never even suspected existed before? Do you see why I say that there is rubbish to be thrown out of the church of Christ? Now maybe you're ready to look at number five, Christmas. In the ancient Roman Empire, the sun god was named Sol Invictus. His birthday was celebrated on the shortest day and longest night of the year. We know it as the winter solstice. And in the old Julian calendar, it fell on guess what day? December 25th. That's the pagan festival honoring the birthday of the sun, S-U-N, fell on December 25th. The formal name of that birthday was Dies Natalis Solis Invicti, the birthday of the unconquered sun. Knowing full well what they were doing, possibly in the hope of winning pagans to Christianity, the Catholic Church baptized this relic of sun worship, December 25th, and introduced it into Christianity as Christmas, the birthday of the S-O-N. What a con game. The birthday of the sun, S-U-N, being palmed off as the birthday of the sun, S-O-N, of God. Before we look at number six, let's summarize here. What have we looked at? What are the symbols that we've looked at today? Symbols that have paganism at their root. Symbols that in some instances point us right back to sun worship and are therefore to be classified as blasphemous, thoroughly alien to Christianity left us by Jesus. Thus far we have one, the solar wheel. Number two, the Pope's mitre. Number three, the monstrance. Number four, the Eucharist. Number five, the pagan festival of the birthday of the sun, Dies Natalis Solis Invicti, which the church baptized and incorporated into Christianity, calling it Christmas. Now maybe you're ready for number six, Sunday. Undoubtedly the most pervasive, 
resilient and deceptive vestige of sun worship in the entire church is the weekly festival of the venerable day of the sun. Those were the words of Emperor Constantine when he instituted the first Sunday law. What makes Sunday keeping so deceptive? Some Christians actually believe they are honoring God by keeping what they see as the Sabbath of the Lord. But Sunday keeping is pagan, a throwback to the times when men worshipped the S-U-N. I'll say it again, what a con game. Beloved, these are relics of the same paganism against which Elijah contended on Mount Carmel. And they must all be exposed acknowledged and repudiated by those of us who call ourselves Christian. Not until the dots are connected in the public consciousness, not until Christians can be brought to see just how many relics of ancient sun worship are alive and well in the church, and not just alive and well, but alive and well and masquerading as legitimate Christian icons. Not until this is done, in my opinion, will the pagan origins of Roman Catholicism be fully revealed across the earth. Not until this is done, the connecting of the dots as I've laid them out today, will the mystery of iniquity receive her death blow. Not until this is done, will the true Sabbath of the Lord, the seventh day Sabbath, be restored to its original place of authority, and dignity across the world. Sun worship must be exposed for what it is. Like the penny brought to Christ in Matthew 22, about which he asked, whose image and superscription is this? So must Sunday sacredness be held up before the world and the same question asked, whose image and superscription is this? That's not Christ's image there on Sunday, my friend. Christ said he was Lord also of the Sabbath, the creator of the Sabbath. That's somebody else's image on Sunday. I don't care what some Christians tell us about the resurrection of Jesus on Sunday. Sunday sacredness is not Christian. And I'll prove it to you right here and right now. If I were in a court of law, Yes, I'd use my Bible and other supporting texts, but I'd build my case around this point. This is what I'd argue. If Paul or any of the apostles had changed the day of worship from Sabbath to Sunday, then without a doubt the Jews would have hurled this charge upon them. Certainly they would have hurled this charge upon Paul when they clamored for his death. Go to your Bible and read it for yourself. Acts 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26. Read it. There is the charge that Paul brought a Gentile into the temple. For they almost killed him over it. But there is no mention of the charge of Sabbath breaking in the litany of charges pressed upon him. Why? Because Paul kept the Sabbath of the Lord. The apostles kept the Sabbath of the Lord. The day of the Lord. No, 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 no. For any, far from being Christian, Sunday keeping is but one more vestige of sun worship that has invaded Christianity and deceived billions. Friend, in Christianity, God makes the rules, not man. No man has the authority to tamper with the law of God and to declare any day holy or, and another unholy or repudiated. How dare any man call the Sabbath of the Lord the Jewish Sabbath? It is neither my Sabbath, nor your Sabbath, nor the Jews' Sabbath, nor the Gentile Sabbath. The Sabbath belongs to God. It is his Sabbath. He made it when he laid the foundations of the earth and no man has the authority to touch it. As for those of us who keep it, we in effect are saying, here is my faith. I believe this planet was created by God in six literal days. But not just our planet. I believe man is a created being and that my homage is due to the God who created me and our planet not to the Pope. 
I will keep the day designated by God as holy to commemorate creation and reject the day dedicated to the S-U-N. How did Jesus put it? Matthew 59, he said, but in vain they do worship me. Do you understand that? Vain, useless. In vain they do worship me. Teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. When you can show me a Sabbath Sunday switch from the Bible, then I'll listen. Thessalonians 2. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let, until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him, whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. For we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast, and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Now, our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and 